Recurrent Pregnancy Loss, What I Want You to Know and What I Wish I Had Known. Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor. This is National Infertility Awareness Week, which is a week really near and dear to my heart for two reasons. One, because I'm a fertility doctor. This is what I do every day, but also because I was you or I was that person. I had infertility specifically. I had recurrent miscarriages and I now have two amazing kids and they're seven and they're eight. But I remember what it was like wondering if it would ever happen. And I remember what it was like losing that naive joy that some people get with pregnancy because I was so worried every moment that I would lose the pregnancy or that something would go wrong. So in this video, we're going to be very quick, but I do want to go over what I want you to know about miscarriage, what I want you to know about having multiple miscarriages and the typical evaluation, and then just some basic things about what it is that you can do or how to advocate for yourself. First of all, infertility is really common. Now we call it one out of every six is going to have infertility. Miscarriage is also common. The hard thing about miscarriage is that so many pregnancies actually miscarry before you may even know that you're pregnant. So it is a little bit different if you're undergoing fertility treatments or taking early pregnancy tests, but if you're waiting to a missed period to check a pregnancy test, you may actually just have a late period by a day or so, but have been pregnant and not even know that. And there was a study published in 1988 called the Incidence of Early Pregnancy Loss in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a landmark study where they checked urinary concentrations in everybody throughout their entire menstrual cycle and got a lot of data about what was happening. And what they found is that 22% of people had an unrecognized pregnancy loss. And when you combine the incidence of those unrecognized and recognized losses, the total rate was over 30%. However, reassuringly, 95% of people who had a pregnancy loss went on to conceive within the next two years. So most people were able to eventually get pregnant with a clinical pregnancy. However, this does show us that a lot of pregnancies miscarry very early. So if this is happening to you, you are not alone. We typically quote the rate of miscarriage one out of five or one out of four, depending on your age, if you're 30 or 35. But it's important to know that as you get older, the incidence of miscarriage increases, and this is directly proportional to your age. And this graph is a great representation. Increase in miscarriage as you get older, this is associated with a decrease in natural pregnancy rates. These things correlate together based on what we call age-related aneuploidy, abnormal chromosome number. And this is the top cause of miscarriage no matter how old you are. The way that I think about this is that our eggs are kept inside our ovaries until we ovulate, but our eggs are held in a stage of cell division called meiosis, and that's when our chromosomes are paired up in the middle and held apart by these meiotic spindles. They separate into that egg that has a 23X when you ovulate. So when you ovulate at 18, they've been sitting there shorter than when you are 25, or 40. So the older you are, the longer your chromosomes have been held in place and the increase in chromosome errors you are going to see direct correlation. What can you do if you're having an increase in aneuploid loss? Well, one option here is going to be IVF. And the reason why is because you can do genetic testing. And by identifying embryos that have the genetic capability, that is going to decrease your time to pregnancy and increase your option to get to live birth. Miscarriage rates are lower with genetically normal or euploid embryos. So that's going to be the option if you are older. If you were younger, you might have an increased prevalence of aneuploidy. We think that happens in some people when we fall into the unexplained pregnancy loss category. But that leads us to question, what are the explained causes? So let's just walk through the quick things that can cause recurrent pregnancy loss, what the workup should be, and what you should know. So an anatomical defect in the uterus, specifically a uterine septum is one of the most common causes. A septum is actually a birth defect. So this is where the uterus is formed in two different pieces. They elongate, fuse together, and then this midline septum failed to reabsorb. I have a whole video on this so you can learn more, but this is surgically correctable. Another thing that could possibly cause miscarriage could be scar tissue inside the lining or uterine fibroids projecting, anything that could interfere with implantation. Moving on from uterine issues, 
we want to move in to tubal disease. So just thinking about tubal disease and understanding it, tubal disease can predispose you to an ectopic pregnancy and not all ectopic pregnancies get to the point where they can be diagnosed clinically, meaning the vast majority of them are just going to miscarry naturally before you would get to the stage where you could detect a pregnancy. So things like endometriosis, prior chlamydia infection, prior abdominal surgery or inflammation might contribute to tubal disease. Then we're going to get into clotting disorders. So when we talk about a clotting disorder, if your body has an increased tendency to clot because of a genetic issue or an autoimmune disease, then you're at risk to have clotting in the small vessels that connect the placenta and maternal fetal vasculature. This can lead to pregnancy loss and if found, can be treated with aspirin or Lovenox or often the both of them together. This, however, typically is a later pregnancy loss. I've actually clinically seen it in both ways, but the classic history is somebody who has a second trimester loss when you really were dependent on those blood vessels for that connection. In reality, remember that the placenta is not really functioning until after nine weeks gestation. So if you're having many really early pregnancy losses, that doesn't really appear to be a contributing factor for why, because that progesterone is being made by the corpus luteum. That said, I have seen it presenting both ways. So if you've had pregnancy losses, you should be screened for clotting disorders, specifically if you had a second trimester loss, or if you had potential placental complications and a loss, like preterm birth, preeclampsia, placental issues or insufficiency growth restriction. Then we're going to lead into other types of issues such as endocrine issues. So classically, this could be thyroid, so uncontrolled hypothyroidism, potentially autoimmune thyroid disease with really high thyroid antibodies, potentially high prolactin, that's not autoimmune, that's endocrine, but having that high prolactin can interfere with normal ovulation or the normal luteal phase, which progesterone is important to opening and closing that implantation window. And then we have diabetes. Having diabetes or an elevated sugar level in your blood and high hemoglobin A1C, that can predispose you to have pregnancy loss and that is improved when you treat it, just like prolactin, just like thyroid. So these endocrine abnormalities are easy blood tests that we can check that can sometimes improve things. Anything else that lives in the spectrum of ovulation disorders can also impact this. So if you're having ovulation issues, potentially from having low ovarian reserve, maybe that is contributing, potentially from having hypothalamic amenorrhea, maybe that's contributing if you're getting higher. We just tend to think that that luteal phase is dependent on a good follicle. So if you're not growing a good follicle, that might be a case where potentially having improved ovulation could benefit you or progesterone support. This all falls in the category of luteal phase defect, which I believe is on the spectrum of ovulation disorders, luteal phase defect, irregular periods, and then going into amenorrhea or absent periods. However, studies have shown us that if we are going to give progesterone for pregnancy loss, it is important to start it before the implantation window, meaning three days after ovulation. So in that luteal phase, when we think the corpus luteum is not making sufficient progesterone. Remember, it's really hard to detect because progesterone is going to rise and fall in pulses throughout the entire luteal phase. And I do have a really great video on progesterone if you want to dive in more to that. But supplementing early can be helpful. If you get a positive pregnancy test and you're bleeding and you get a low progesterone and you supplement then, it is too late to make a difference. And there is this chicken and egg hypothesis where a poor pregnancy that's chromosomally abnormal is going to communicate to the body by not stimulating as much HCG, therefore not stimulating as much progesterone, and then causing a miscarriage. That said, in some people who have an ovulation issue, giving progesterone in the luteal phase is easy and relatively low risk and potentially beneficial. Another thing in the spectrum of genetics, aneuploidy, random chromosome abnormalities. You can also have inherited abnormalities, specifically what's called a balanced translocation. The way I want you to think about this is your chromosomes have switched spots so that your body doesn't care where your chromosomes are. They're encoding proteins to be made and they can do all of this. But if they've switched spots, when they go and separate, now they're in the wrong place and that can cause a very high incidence of miscarriage. 
Typically, we go to IVF so we can do genetic testing because there's no natural way to overcome that. That is just how your body is going to split. And then we have sperm issues. We definitely are seeing emerging evidence that abnormal sperm shape, exposure to things like marijuana, smoking cigarettes, and other toxins in the male partner is contributing to miscarriage and pregnancy loss. Therefore, this is a couple's thing. I also say your egg quality, what you can do, you can't control your age, but you can control how much inflammation your body has. Avoiding those toxins, watch the video on egg quality. Think about what you can do to eat healthy, have a lot of antioxidants, get good sleep so your body can repair itself, and that is controlling what you can do. You should get an evaluation now after two pregnancy losses. That is when we typically should draw the blood work and look at your uterus and make sure that everything is fine. Should you do lifestyle changes? Absolutely, that's easy and what you can control. Should you also consider getting an evaluation and treating what you find? Yes. Studies have been mixed on baby aspirin. I often put a lot of patients on it because there's very little harm, but potential benefit. There's some very rare things that can cause pregnancy loss, like sticky platelet syndrome, and we think that falls into the category of autoimmune disease. Do we know that autoimmune disease attacks a pregnancy particularly? No. Is it probably through the pathway of inflammation? Yes. But any untreated illness, autoimmune or not, when your body is busy fighting it off, it doesn't have the resources it needs to help grow a pregnancy. So I want you to take away any self-blame. You did not cause your miscarriage, but you're gonna reframe your mindset to do what you can here going forward. You're going to avoid toxins, put healthy nutrients in your body, get an evaluation, find a doctor and a care team you trust, and find a support system. On National Infertility Awareness Week, the one thing I wish I had done different was open up to my friends and family more. I never told them I was pregnant, so it was hard to tell them that I was losing the pregnancy time and time again. And if I could rewind the clock, and after being on this side of the table so long, that's the one thing I say. You don't need to announce to the world, but please consider telling your support system what you're going through because they can't be there if you don't let them. Thank you guys so much. As always, I appreciate you here. I appreciate you helping grow this channel. Please support your friends with infertility this week. Spread awareness. One out of six is not uncommon. You can always listen to the As A Woman podcast for more information, or you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford, MD. Thanks, friends.